I think you'll find that many fundamentals of modern small unit tactics are both universal and relatively timeless, as there are only so many ways to go about it. But each nation in each time period will have its own idiosyncrasies. With that in mind, this video will cover one specific nation's army at one specific time in history, and the terminology herein will appropriately reflect that focus. For the sake of simplicity, this video will feature a squad operating by itself, while ordinarily squads attacked as part of the platoon effort, and the platoon as part of the company, and so on. We'll start with our demonstration squad here leaving its forward assembly area, during a phase of the attack known as the approach march. While battle may have been chaos, there were defined steps to offensive action. The attack transitioned between various set stages, and progress was marked by reaching successive phase lines. The squad's attack began when it crossed the line of departure, commonly abbreviated LD. During a coordinated attack, the squad might first occupy an attack position, the last covered and concealed position before reaching the LD. For those wondering, cover provided protection from enemy fire, whereas concealment provided protection from enemy observation. So a hill provides both cover and concealment, whereas a smokescreen provides concealment but no cover. Uh, I suppose bulletproof glass is one of the few things that could provide cover but not concealment. Anyway, an attack position was the last place to finish checks, finalize orders, and designate rallying points before all hell broke loose. Rallying points, also confusingly referred to in some manuals as assembly points, were defined as a place which a unit commander chooses for assembling and reorganizing his troops after an action in preparation for further operations. A rallying point could be to the rear of the squad, such as a location where a patrol could regroup if it was ambushed, or uh, it could be to the squad's front, uh, where its members could regroup if, uh, for example, they were scattered during a river crossing. From the assembly area or attack position, a squad passed through the line of departure at their assigned point of departure, employing one of the uh, tactical formations I discussed in my previous video, ordinarily a column or diamond. When advancing in the presence of the enemy, the squad is preceded by its scouts who seek out the enemy and prevent surprise. Scouts precede the squad at such distance that it will not be subjected to surprise small arms fire. To cause the scouts to precede their unit, the command is, Scouts out. If the location of the enemy was not known, scouts tried to discover them without being discovered first themselves. Upon spotting the enemy, a scout signaled enemy in sight. Uh, from some type of concealed position, it would have been unhealthy to stand up and hold a rifle over your head in full view of enemy personnel. If the scouts were detected first, things happened quickly. According to doctrine, when scouts were fired upon, the squad immediately took cover, and the scouts returned fire with tracer ammunition to point out the enemy positions. There was a practiced manner for GIs to hit the ground, and once there, roll over sideways into a firing position. Taking cover. Rolling to escape gunfire, because the enemy aims where you drop. The squad leader made a quick estimate of the situation. He had to decide whether or not the enemy position could be reduced by his squad alone. Generally, a single squad would not attack an entrenched enemy squad unless complete surprise was assured, as it was about the only advantage they had. A similar sized defending force enjoyed several advantages of cover, concealment, firepower, and uh, pre-selected and cleared fields of fire. An attacker, on the other hand, had to advance exposed above the ground and couldn't bring all of his weapons to bear while he was moving. Other conditions being equal, any given force is markedly stronger in defense than in offense. If any force attacks an equal force in an organized position of its own choosing, the repulse of the attacker is virtually certain, unless superior leadership or some favorable circumstance offsets the inherent advantage of the defense. It has often been held that a combat superiority of at least 2 to 1 is necessary to justify offensive action. Accepting this as a general premise, it is still true that the natural advantages of the defense may be counterbalanced by the advantages of the initiative and of surprise. Fortunately, this video can continue, because our intrepid squad leader has decided he can take the enemy MG with his squad alone. He has what was called an adequate superiority of force. Uh, thus begins a new phase of the attack, the firefight. The squad leader needed to bring his squad up where it could most effectively engage the enemy. This may or may not have been on line of scouts, as they could have been caught out in a terrible position. But the purpose of the firefight was to gain fire superiority. At the first firing position, the squad seeks to gain fire superiority over the enemy to its front, 
Fire superiority is gained by subjecting the enemy to fire of such accuracy and intensity that his fire becomes so inaccurate or so reduced in volume as to be ineffective. Once gained, it must be maintained. The squad and smaller groups must be trained to place a large volume of accurate fire upon probable enemy locations and indistinct or concealed targets such as enemy machine guns or small groups. The squad and smaller groups must be trained to apply such fire quickly upon order or signal of their leader and in appropriate circumstances to apply it without such order. During the firefight, the primary duty of the squad leader is to place the fire of his squad on the target. Doctrinally, the squad leader uh, fires only in emergency, or when he considers the firepower to be gained by his firing outweighs the necessity for his close control of the squad. It seems it would be relatively easy to classify any firefight you were personally in at the time as some level of emergency. As with everything, there was a prescribed way to go about this. Each member of the squad fires his first shot on that portion of the target corresponding generally to his position in the squad. He then distributes his next shots to the right and left of his first shot, covering that part of the target on which he can deliver accurate fire without having to change position. The portion of the target which one man can cover will depend upon the range and the position of the firer. Frequently, each man will be able to cover the entire target with accurate fire. This should be done whenever possible. Fire is not limited to points within the target known to contain the enemy. On the contrary, all men space their shots so that no portion of the target remains unhit. From a position best suited to provide support, the automatic rifleman distributes his fire over the entire target or on any target which will best support the advance of other members of the squad. This method of fire distribution is employed without command. You'll read bogus claims floating around the internet that GIs back then were only trained to fire at targets they could clearly see, but as you can clearly see, that's demonstrably false. As the basic field manual for the M1 plainly puts it, members of the squad must be trained to place a heavy fire on the designated area even though no specific targets are visible. After all, it's not the man you see high above the grass who is going to cause you the trouble. It's the man low in the grass, along the line, that you can't see at all. This type of fire was known as distributed fire, as opposed to concentrated fire, which was fire delivered against point targets. Targets were also called out in a prescribed manner. A complete target designation includes the following elements. Range, how far to look. Direction, where to look. Description, what to look for. These elements are always given with a slight pause between elements. The manual gives examples such as range 425, left front, sniper at base of dead tree, or range 500, right front, watch my tracer, machine gun. The manual also mentions that distinct and fleeting targets can be pointed out with extreme brevity using something as simple as those men. Frequently, the squad leader will be able to designate the target to only one or two members of his squad. Therefore, each member of the squad must be taught to assist in designating the targets to the other members of the squad team. At times, the entire target designation will be furnished by the scouts to other members of the squad as they arrive in the vicinity. The squad leader may engage two targets by placing a number of riflemen under the command of the assistant squad leader, directing him to engage one target while he, the squad leader, engages the other target with the automatic rifleman and other members of the squad. It could also be the other way around, with the assistant squad leader in charge of the BAR team while the squad leader commanded the rifleman, uh, whichever circumstances demanded. Fire control was aided by arm and hand signals. People may have an impression that arm and hand signals are some sort of modern tactical invention, or that their only role was to facilitate stealth, but they were often necessary because the battlefield was a very noisy place. Basic voice commands were supplemented by these signals. And there were no squad radios, so if soldiers wanted to communicate outside of voice range but within visual range, it was a simple way to do that. All GIs would be familiar with a few dozen gestures, many of which haven't changed since, and were already old at the time. Some have remained exactly the same for many generations. Others have evolved slightly over the decades, but as you can see, their lineage is plainly evident. And they go back further than these illustrations. There are descriptions of them in 19th century drill manuals. The entire squad usually holds its fire until the range to the target is 500 yards or less. However, under favorable conditions, the automatic rifle is effective against enemy troops or areas known to contain enemy groups at ranges between 500 yards and 1,000 yards. That's uh, roughly between 457 and 914 meters. Other training aids flatly state, rifle fire is of little effect at ranges beyond 400 yards. That's about uh, 366 meters. 
as fire beyond that was considered ineffective and therefore a waste of ammo.